happens quarterly for us, so welcome to our first one of the year, um, where we have Jessica and Robert speaking to us tonight about Agile Tools. Um, we're going to take a quick look at the agenda just so you can see what we're up to tonight, some appreciations and business for the Agile Meetups, and then we'll get into our session and we'll talk about all these tools and you guys will get to retro a bit at the end. Um, as with every meetup, it's interactive, so you guys should be able to ask questions and post to a parking lot, too, if we have questions that need to go on towards the end. So feel free to engage with our speakers. I'd like to thank our sponsors tonight. First of all, Kaiser University, and I'm looking for candy. donated this space for us and if you've never used their space I've taken classes here I've been to conferences here uh, two different conferences here and they're very accommodating uh, and it's a great space to be so I highly recommend it and if she comes in the room before we end the sponsor discussion we'll let her talk to you for a few minutes and we also want to thank the Eliasson group for our food tonight
need to set up a table. And uh, we have an on ground student population. We have about 900 students on ground. So you'd have a lot of people coming to talk to you, a lot of FaceTime. And we work with our instructors who send the students down during their breaks. So it's a constant flow and not just an inundation of students. So employers seem to enjoy that. So that's our career fair that we have. Again, that's March the 14th. The next thing we have come up, coming up is our advisory board. Twice a year we have what's called an advisory board. These are, the, these are the board members who tell us what it is that we need to be offering to our students to make sure they are really ready for the workforce. What do we need to provide to them to give that competitive advantage? So I am always looking for new advisory board members. Um, the two panels that I look over are the technology management, software engineering, oh, and also cyber forensics. So if you have an expertise in any of those three, please, um, I would love to have you sign up and attend. We do feed you dinner. And basically being a board member means attending these meetings and it's about an hour and a half out of your time twice a year. And your, your opinions go directly to our office of the chancellor and those changes are implemented over those next several months. We've made so many different changes. A great example of what a change we've made is a lot of schools offer technology using a virtual environment. Because of our board members, I now have state-of-the-art Cisco equipment that my students learn on, hands-on. Hands-on. I've never seen students so excited when we first started bringing on these hands-on labs. I've even had to create a separate lab for them to come in so they can learn more stuff. And so they're learning outside the classroom. One thing we also implemented is the lab we have um, they can actually hack each other. So we're learning basic hack, ethical hacking skills. Um, so those are just some of the things that we've implemented for our students. So again, thank you very much. And please feel free to reach out to me. I've left my cards here and flyers. So we look forward to working with each one of you. Thank you. Daily, like while I was here, I approved to you know people requesting to join our group. Um, and just a little bit about all the stuff that we have going on, right? This is our big tent meetup. We do six lean coffees and or lean beers a month. Uh, we have the product owner meetup there every other month. Scrum Masters Guild every month empower agile teams, which is to incorporate more than just QA, but QA was the primary focus there, and we've changed their name because it didn't feel inclusive enough to them. And they have a good uh, game night coming up, so I highly recommend it. Um, we have Heart of Agile. Patrick is here. So there he is. Tomorrow night, just across the bridge. Thanks. And Alistair will be here in town, so if you haven't met Alistair, please come and meet him. Um, we have the Grow Financial Tour. Um, they're scheduled, I think, once a week now. But I go ahead and check out because they have a waiting list if you want to see what they've done over their journey. And our newest meetup is uh, the local chapter of Women in Agile. And they, uh, next week, have their first networking event. Um, and not just women are invited. So guys, if you want to come on out and meet up, you can too. But I highly recommend attending. And there's the listing of the meetups there on the other side. So we're still growing. We're doing very well. And we love the involvement from our community. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. It's all you. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> well, hello. Uh, I'm Robert Chaw. Um, I am a, a Director of Enterprise Agility over at Catalina Marketing. And the reason I'm here tonight is uh, we recently went through a migration of JIRA to Target Process. And utilized and rolled out Target Process from the portfolio level down to the team level. Um, we're still most of the way through that journey and it's going to evolve as we grow. Um, and then prior to that, um, I spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania as a chief agilist for a company called Frontline Technologies, where they're utilizing uh, first uh, Rally uh, and then eventually a combination of Jira and AHA. We actually ran a scaled agile program for two and a half years. Um, so I've seen the tool implementation rolled out in both of those tools as well. Um, so I'm here tonight to give a little bit of color into how Target Process handles it. Um, I heard it's somewhat of a, a newer tool on the block, um, and I guess that's, that's about it.
How do we do the project management in these tools?
the next part we're going to go over is about 10 minutes, and we've time boxed everything else to 15 minutes. However, I have a feeling you guys may want to dig deeper in some of these things. Um, and based on what we have here, it looks like there's a relatively even, I would say, at least with Azure DevOps and Jira, and then relatively even with target process and collaborate. So I'd like to try to get to all of them. Um, do you guys, I'd, I'd like you to control this time box. Would you like to do Roman voting, going from whatever is the first we go through it? And then, so Roman voting real quick, for those of you who don't know, thumbs up means yes. So everyone put your thumbs up if it's yes. No, I don't want to do adding extra minutes into each of these things because I want to get to what I want to do, or I'm just going to go with the group. All right, so that's where we're voting. We can understand um, the feedback <coughs> of our audience just based on your thoughts, if you will. So are you guys cool with doing the Roman voting as we um, go into each of the demos? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Anybody not cool with it? All right, cool. So I need someone to, on their phone, dedicate to doing a 15-minute time box. Thank you. <laughs> so the next one will be actually 10 minutes. Everything else will be 15. Starting now. All right. So how do you even get started to think about how you should configure a tool? It isn't just go in and configure it. You have to really understand what problem you're solving. You need to understand your why. If you think about it, this thing you're configuring is a product. Someone is going to use this. They're going to have to interact with it. We need to understand the problems that they face when they're using the tool, and the people who need the information <coughs> the problems that they face. They're two different personas, right? And then within the users and the people who want the data, there could be many personas in that, too. Right? So we need to understand our users. We don't just need to determine what we want to know. We need to just understand what we need to know. Um, a lot of times what I've seen when I go to companies is that they're capturing all of these metrics and having people do a whole bunch of things just because they think it's the right way to do it. We don't actually need to do all of that. We are looking at this at scale. We want to try to make it as frictionless and easy as possible when it comes to interacting with the tool and getting the uh, best information in the least amount of time. And we need to understand what our overarching goal is. So what does success mean in your context as it relates to the goal? I'm going to take one step back because I forgot to introduce the parking lot. So, as we continue to go through this and you have questions, please ask questions. This is interactive. If it's something that's going to uh, give us some more clarity around this topic, we'll dive right into it. If it's something that we're definitely going to tackle later on, we'll put it in the parking lot so we don't forget about it. Also, at your table you have post-its and jarbies. As we're going through this, because I know you guys are probably thinking, I want to solve this problem at my company, or have some interest, it's not enough to understand how to do it, but you need to understand what forces are impacting uh, the way that you might even be able to uh, attain that change. So, so for instance, if I want to say, I learned a whole bunch of stuff last night with Jessica, and we're going to reconfigure everything, right? Well, do you have the agency to do that? Right? And if you don't have the agency, do you have um, the ability to influence somebody else who does have the agency? Right? So understand what forces may be against the change that you're trying to do. So write those things down to keep it top of mind. Because, like I said, it's not enough to know how to do it. You need to understand um, how you have to navigate your system to get things done as well. All right. So the next piece, and I'm really talking to those who would um, drive this change, so who have um, the agency to do it and are responsible for doing it. So we need to determine our relevant organizational value stream and capability. I'm talking about your business architecture. So what does value look like as it moves through your system, and how should we set up a tool so we can visually see that value? Because if we have a whole bunch of people working in a whole bunch of different places in their own types of ways, and they're all calling one piece of data a totally different thing across the entire system, we need to have some integrity of that data. We need to understand the big picture. So uh, first and foremost, what do our value streams and organizational capabilities look like in this piece that we're trying to uh, change? 
So when we think about that in the big picture, how are teams formed to deliver on this solution? So what, are our te what does our team structure look like? And then, from there, we want to define our governance standards. So what is the minimum governance or workflow necessary to ensure we can validate our success, which is that goal that we said that we were, we're trying to achieve? I know this isn't the tool, right? But it's kind of what we need to do before we can dive into it. Any questions about that? Yeah? So it's more of a comment. Somebody had mentioned anti patterns, and I think that's yes. the short list. You um, know what? You had something really good to say about this. Yeah, so that was, when, when you think about it, it's, I am I'm working on that. There we go. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. Dinner was good. <laughs> <laughs> no, when, when you think about scaling and you think about agile, it's, it's really important, as you as just pointed out, to have those practices dialed in at the individual level, at the team level, understanding what how you govern, how you measure at the team level. Because the minute you start scaling it, you're going to start scaling bad practices along with the good. And when you get to two teams, five teams, 10 teams, 20 teams, 250 people, all of a sudden those little nuances that are off at the team level become perfectly in efforts to correct at the organization level. So the practice of setting up the value stream, the practice of understanding what your minimum low watermark is, I guess for team and standards and governance and, and, and how that actually drives measurement inside the organization is really, really important to at least understand what that looks like before you start crawling out and blowing up and expecting the tool to solve a scaling problem. Um, if, if anything, they cause more, trying to go there first causes way more trouble than if you were to not try to scale at all. Yes. <laughs> so, for our use case, if you will, for the session of um, how we have configured the tools, is that we're trying to achieve outcomes to deliver business Right? Wow, that <laughs> car has an awesome engine. I'm sorry. <laughs> Opportunity um, they may want to go seek to flow through their system of delivery. 
Uh, then our portfolio tier, uh, if we're doing that scaled approach, this is where we're going to look at our high overarching goals of that initiative that we can deliver on an incremental basis to make sure that we're uh, achieving what we intended uh, in that initiative. And those broken down into features, um, which product teams would drive through the system of delivery. delivery. <laughs> Um, and that, those would help set the technical direction and provide the context and should be deliverable in the course of a release. And we're trying to get releases also down, right? So we want um, to have them uh, be one to three months, depending on your organization, uh, for our use case. <laughs> and then delivery teams, this is potentially shippable stories. So that's the team structure, and we should have visibility of that work so I should, if I'm at the delivery team, I should be able to understand the big picture um, all the way from the top. Not just because, oh, I can look at the tool to do it, but because we've also had the conversations. And because we've also had the feedback loops, right, that occur. The tool facilitates that. It doesn't solve for it. But also from the top down, I'm not asking for status. <coughs> getting feedback to drive the next decision I need to make. What is, what is the value of having the teams at those levels also operate as a team? I'm sorry? Having the teams at those levels also operate as a team. So at the, at the product level or the portfolio level, the semblance of this is their team and their team's backlog and they have a role to get it through the system. Yeah, that's important too. Definitely. And, and, and that is I would say the tool isn't going to solve for that, right? But that's something you need to aggregate around that team. I know that we hit time. So I'm going to get through this just quickly. <laughs> I'll get to the tool. Um, again, oh yeah, fine, I don't get more minutes. Exactly. Right? That's not, I don't, I'm not allowed to. I'm going to just try to drive through it. <laughs> All right, so then we identified the work that the teams are going to flow through this system, right? So initiatives, epics, features, and stories. And so what this might look like at scale, and for some companies, this might be too much scale, right? I'd like, personally, just to be clear, um, but we're looking at top-down, it might look something like this, an enterprise delivery approach. All right, so now we can start the next time box. Introducing our planning tool demos. So it looks like it's between Azure DevOps and Jira for a start. So, Raise a hands to start with Jira. Raise a hands for Azure DevOps. Looks like Jira won that one. <laughs> but don't fret, we'll get to both. People don't know DevOps, that's why. Oh, VSTS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's now called Azure DevOps. It is a terrible name. <laughs>
which is going to be the overarching, um, uh, I would say, umbrella over our products. Because you're going to see, and I think another good example is Microsoft Word, right? You go to Microsoft Office, you have all of the different suites of products. So um, you might have a portfolio that says, I have a niche tip that goes across all of the different products, right? But the product itself also drives your own business. So when we look at uh, Rideshare, so this is just because Rideshare. Um, we have a function for drive, right? So we have um, a place where this, ex this drive experience is happening. We also have food delivery. What's this sound like? It's not it. <laughs> so we also have food delivery. We also have a function for maps, right? Because even though the experience uh, is what it is in um, all of these, we, we broke that out into the products. And then we have um, the ride itself experience. Now one thing that I've broken out of this that I usually do in all of um, the projects that and um, tools that I configure is I break out risks. And risks are owned by the portfolio, but also um, handled by the team. And they have their own process that we want to make sure that we're deliberate on getting ahead of. Each of the products may have one or many delivery teams. And some of these delivery teams might, like NAPS, for instance, might actually be delivering on some of the goals that are owned by other products, and we'll show that today. So when we think about how we actually deliver, so at the, oh wait, I said we were going to do Jira first, didn't I?
13, so you're going to be driven from this top piece. So I'm going to go in um, to the highest level real quick, but that's not where uh, you normally uh, operate because they're not going to be in there as often, I would say. But uh, all right. So each team is going to have their own board. And this is going to be based on what is in each area of cap. So for instance, if I'm looking at the investments, I can see them here. But even if I drop down to the portfolio, I can see them there too. Now, as you continue to go um, down into the system of delivery, you'll have the same boards, which potentially will show the same work, but you're going to have filters um, that will drive what you see so it's not too busy when it comes to uh, everything that you need to um, know and work on when it comes to what you want to work for the system. All right. So when we look at the epics, this is where our um, portfolio team would get them ready for the delivery team to act or the, the pro product team to execute. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our pro our portfolio team is working in here to drive the rest of the system of delivery. So a few things that you might want to see just right away would be your cumulative flow. Now this is not a pretty cumulative flow because I've built a lot of this data today. <laughs> so your cumulative flow shouldn't look like this, um, but you have also ways that you can edit um, how you want to see it, things of that sort. Um, the other cool thing is, even at this tier, you can have your dashboard. Now I built some stuff in here of some things that maybe this team would want to look at, and keep in mind, we did, um, I did build a lot of this very soon, so some of the data isn't perfect, but you can get the big uh, picture idea. So one thing I really, really, really like about the STS is the ability to, and, and the ease, to create queries that drive widgets on dashboards. Um, I actually think that this is the easiest tool when it comes to that, I know version one and target process, they have their embedded things, but I feel like I have control of this. So I really like it. Um, with Jira, there's a lot of that control, but there's not as great of a way to visualize it. So some of the things that uh, we might see on a portfolio, uh, especially if there's a lot of quality issues, is the stage of defect, um, the understanding how old our defects are by creation of date, um, understanding our cumulative flow of our ethics, our epic cycle time, our lead time, uh, release batch. So when I'm looking at a release, like how many features can I get through my system of delivery? Um, my throughput. Uh, so how many, and then it, as we're sizing them with swag, how big they are. So I'm the same thing on the throughput. So that's just an example. Are you guys using, those of you who are using VFTS, are you guys using dashboards in this way? What are some of the things that you wish you would, could solve on this dashboard? I wish they put the calendar back. The what? The calendar. A calendar? Okay. Yeah, we have a calendar on the dashboard over there. Now that's hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they will be on the wars. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you who are using uh, the SPS, did you know that you could do this with dashboards? Okay, good. Alright, so then when it comes down to more of the fun stuff, let's go back to the board. So the portfolio would want to um, operate at the Epic tier, uh, but have visibility into obviously the features and the stories too. Just the visibility to um, help with uh, get ahead of risks, dependencies, etc. Uh, so let's drive down to our product. Do right. So with Pride, as you can see, we're not um, we're not seeing as many epics because we only want to see what our um, product is really focused on. Uh, the other thing I really like about this is that you can build out features and any children right in the board um, and then move from um, building out the details in the board as you move through the system. Um, and this is where I like to operate. Now there's some other places that you can go. Some people don't like to operate 
from a Kanban. Personally, I think it's great because you can staff rank things and then actually work um, on the objective that is um, defined for your exit criteria in each of those areas. But you can also work from your backlog too. Um, and you can filter it in all different ways. You can work from queries, etc. Uh, but one of the cool things um, that I also like about this is this feature timeline. How many of you have used feature timeline before? So it's a little, I would say, if, as long as you're working top down, it works really well. But if you start to work bottom up, and then you need to change things at the top, it messes up what you've done at the bottom. Just a, a word of caution. The way that I set this up, the epic roadmap doesn't work in beta because of um, what we're trying to do with limiting, um, really driving our roadmaps on uh, each of the iterations. The epic roadmap wants to kind of mix it all from top to bottom and it, it, it just doesn't work with the system. But you, if you wanted to use it, you could just change your system and use it that way. So as you can see here with Plan Our Trip, um, we have it so this way we can see our epic. Um, in this feature timeline and what uh, features we're planning um, across PIs. Now I know I told you that our goal is to um, complete a feature in a release or a PI, right? When you're first getting started, that may not be your PI. <laughs> so sometimes they might stand and this will give you the opportunity to do that. And the other thing is you can dive deeper um, into the stories. My recommendation is not to do that this, at this tier. Actually doing this at your delivery tier makes a lot more sense, and I'll show you that. Um, you can also plan from here. So um, like if I wanted to add a just location, I can do that, and now we have that here. If you needed to get rid of that, you would actually have to go back to your top tier. And it would come off here. You can't just take it from... Um, you can't just take it from your plan and drop it into the stuff that hasn't been planned. It won't let you do that. So it's like an extra step if you ask them to drop it. All right. So then from product, we're going to go down to delivery. So the delivery team, um, you can see your features and your stories. Now, each feature, a delivery team should be able to, because we want to break dependencies, they should be able to deliver in its entirety. Do you want five more minutes, or do you want to go on to target process? So, five more minutes of the STS? Thumbs down if you do not want five more minutes. Thumbs up if you do. All right, this is going to be easier for hands. Hands up if you want five more minutes. <laughs> hands up if you do not want five more minutes. All right, so target process is next. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> I like the whole control. The Jessica, one question during the transfer. Uh, yep. At what point does capacity start rolling up in BSTS? In BSTS, that's a hard problem to solve for. Because capacity is in hours in BSTS. Um, we can do some fun things to make it work, but it's not easy. Um, let's talk, let me put that in the parking lot. All right, thank you. Oh yeah, it's going to be 90 minutes. I'm like, 90 minutes talking about target process? I got this. <laughs> and I was like 15, and I feel like I'm on a pit crew changing tires at the uh, Indianapolis I went for the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, however, uh, just as a reminder, Jira was, was uh, voted first in our... <laughs> just thought I'd bring up the crowd. Go ahead, keep going. I noticed that, too. We were saying the best for last. Yeah, did you hear a different voice for when am I down to 14 minutes now? 13? Uh, no pressure. 14.4. All right, so um, real quick. So target process as a whole, what I would like about it from a tool, is that it is one of the, one of the tools out there that really does integrate portfolio planning all the way down through team planning and execution. And it, it connects the whole thing to one end of the other. Um, I know you have time tracking on there. It also has a time tracking component to it. We actually manage our time and CapEx and are spending our financials through it. So it has that expanded capability. Um, 
And uh, just I mean, for candor, I've been working in it for a year, and when I first came down and moved down to the area, it was like, hey, we're, we have AHA and Jira, and we're going to be rolling out that way, and then a few months later I landed, it's like target process. And I was like, oh, I'm skeptical, new tool, I haven't used this, am I going to like it, am I going to hate it, I know the other one so well. Um, a year into it, actually, they've been very, very impressive in what they put together, and they continually are rolling out features. Um, what I hope to go through today is, um, you know, one, this, I just put this up there, you know, there's kind of their hierarchy structure and their team structure and their plan structure, and a lot of the same elements that we see inside of scaling. Um, and then we talk a little bit about their planning thing. They have planning components such as releases, iterations, team iterations. They have some build management, some request management, and head management. Um, that's really just to kind of show the comprehensiveness of the layers that they built into the tool. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in how you utilize uh, things like programs and projects. Um, just for example, a, you know, a program is kind of a collection aspect. So um, you know, you, if you have programs in certain elements, you can group um, projects and teams underneath that as a program level. Um, projects, they can be used in the traditional project aspect. Um, as the tools evolved and as we've been using it um, over at Catalina, we've actually used this to represent value stream. And kind of that long-lived funded aspect of just a continual stream of work. And it actually works very well in supporting that. All right, so going over at the highest level, I'm going to stay on this slide somewhat quickly, and I haven't collapsed because there's some sensitive data on here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, but this is actually the collapsed version of our organizational roadmap. On this view here, there are seven or eight different value streams represented, um, and that's designated by the color. And this particular view that we have laid out, looking at the left-hand side, you'll see that we have sort of a high-level <coughs> categorization or score. Um, all of our portfolio epics or initiatives at the highest level funding level, um, we categorize just by oxygen, right? Is it something that we need to breathe? Is it something the organization needs to survive? And then the scoring goes down below there to, you know, sort of based on value and return on investment, platinum, gold, and silver, and so on. So we kind of use that as that high level classification of all the possible work and things that they'd like to get done. Here's just a quick way to sort it based on what we get for spending our team budget. Um, just expanding this a little bit, I'll show some low value stuff just to blow it out. When I blow this out and expand it, if it actually works. There we go. All right, right now I have target process set up in timeline. View. So we have a backlog and we have a timeline and there's dates running across the top. Um, not to spend a lot of time here, most people will do that. Um, I, this was really just a highlight. One of the, the, the features of our process is most of the views are purpose. So I can go from a timeline view to a more traditional portfolio Kanban view um, using the same data. So what I have here is that same thing broken down by funnel state. And where is it in that funnel? Is it planned? Is it backlog? Is it um, playing off of that view just a little bit more, going down a level. So going to global portfolio, down to a value stream portfolio inside of data and analytics. So here I have that same view just broken out by intake state. Okay. So getting into data that we can actually play with. All right. So this I kind of created, uh, this view specifically for this demo so we could kind of show a little bit more of the, the, the inner workings of the tool. Um, we have a Tampa Agile Demo Roadmap Value Stream, right? And here we have the intake funnel going over there, and we have our cards in there, and created a investment or portfolio epic called My Home Remodel. Um, like in most of the tools, you have the ability to figure out what you want on the cards and you know pick and choose what's on there, kind of a standard feature. Um, let's actually open one up. So inside of there, you know, you have the description like you'd expect to see. Um, and then in target process world, um, you have the ability to plan out the epics or link epics back live in line. Oh, there we go. So he's going to give you the ability to do quick create or speed create epics underneath there. Um, also, most of the views, if they're set up, will drag and drop from a prioritization standpoint. Right? And then 
most of the views, depending on how they're set up, will also roll out and show up the hierarchy. Um, so this is their standard one. The standard one under Epic goes Epic to Feature. And then if I cross over to the Features tab, created stuff, um, that goes out to the story level. When you get to the custom views, you can actually go hierarchy end-to-end -end in one view and filter and sort the data that, the way you want to see it. So if you have one or two epics that are really important to you, go to filter, go to view, complete hierarchy. Alright, so um, that's kind of the grand tour of kind of the portfolio level in a short period of time. So kind of the next stage in plan is taking features and getting them into some sort of quarterly plan or PI plan or some sort of time box based plan. Thank you. So in this particular view, I have um, two teams. Uh, I figured with them I wouldn't have to go out and create a whole, uh, you know, a whole agile release train with multiple teams on there. I have two teams represented. And going across here, we have the backlog and then we see um, some time box PIs going across the top. So what is kind of neat about this is, you know, I do get the total and I do get the ability to do a burn down. But inside of here, I can also look at, oh, now it's not showing, where are you? There you are, it moved. Um, the roll of capacity. So for each of those sprints that are associated with those teams inside of this release, I can set a capacity value. Now, for ease of demo, there's two teams, there's three sprints within the PI, each of those teams has 50 points of capacity plan. So, it's basically doing that, that roll up from a capacity level to team level and saying these teams, these sprints associated with this PI planning event, let me set the capacity bar for you. Right. The one thing I'm not going to be able to demo that I'll just mention is the tool gets a little bit smarter as it goes and eventually we'll start figuring out and presenting that capacity data on that planning view. So as you're doing the planning, you actually get the running tally of here's what my capacity is, and here's how what you're planning is going against it. All right. For the demo today, I'll be able to show part of that, um, which is basically, let's see, where's something that has value. If we plan these features, and we put some of these features onto the team, we'll actually see the plan total incrementing up here. Um, if we had capacity, which I didn't have, I don't think the FC has given me any of it yet. Um, with the capacity calculation enabled, it needs time and a couple of PIs to go through and do that, but it will eventually start displaying that demo or that data in the pop-up there as well. Um, where I can see it is I can take this view and shift it over to list view. So now I have the same data just in a different perspective of how we want to plan. As you mentioned, some people are board people and some people are list people. Um, I go back and forth depending on the day of the week. So here we have Q, uh, a, a PI increment Q1 2019, um, and my capacity is set to 300, which was calculated based on, there we go, the two team sprints. So I have two team sprints underneath here, both with their uh, capacity set, and there, there's their overall total of the sum. So from the list view, you can also get the same information. Um, on both the card view and in the list view, it is completely configurable for what fields at what level you so, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, I have a number of features associated with underneath here, and I think if I pull out this to the user story level, yep. So I have my, uh, at the feature level, my total number of open and resolved user stories. I could also add bugs, tasks, other work items that go along underneath there. Um, where are these tasks? Can I show that with you? Here we go. So I've got the story level, and if I had tasks being filled out, I could actually see the tasks I'm doing. Um, and just to call out, it also supports cross workspace or cross value stream. So for some reason, as we were doing PI planning, we had dependencies on another team and another work stream. Uh, you have the ability to cross wire or hop value streams inside the tool. And if you're at a strategic or a planning level, it will show you what work stream has what work, what team has what assignment, and what sprint that does that visibility across those streams. And if you're not spot on with it, you will drive yourself nuts trying to figure it out the first time. All right. So um, taking that next, that, uh, 
that next look, what I have here was the team sprint planning view. Um, so I am down at two teams inside of that PI planning time box, inside of that release. And I have my view filtered for stories that are associated to a feature in there. All right, so I have kind of narrowed my query parameter. So just kind of giving a sense at the team level, you have the ability for the team to kind of do some speed planning and kind of pick off the backlog and kind of start planning what they're going to be doing where. Um, from that view here, you also have the ability to kind of get to a couple of quick metrics, such as your burn down, your cycle time, right? So that's kind of the quick view of the data. Um, and like this, uh, I don't think cycle time is going to show yet. Yeah. Not enough data to show a pretty chart. <laughs> but it is pretty. <laughs> Trust me. All right. Um, inside of here as well, um, one of the things that I like to do is also do my sprint planning or backlog refinement, um, kind of doing that rolling wave type of sprint planning of um, that view was set up to have the parent sprint, one previous sprint, uh, this one doesn't have the previous sprint, but typically I'll set this view up to do one previous, my current, and two or three ahead. So when we're going through refinement and we're starting to talk a little bit about planning and how these lay out within the PI, I at least have a picture of what's inside of there that I can start I can start playing with dragging and dropping into those sprites. So I kind of, again, just showcasing probably my favorite feature is just that dual, dual purpose of view. Um, so there you have the ordered list of backlog up on the right and kind of just looking at it from a refinement standpoint is just a quick way that loads the details of the story as it goes. So again, all driven from one view, just different ways of slicing it. How am I doing on time? Minute and a half. Minute and a half, excellent. All right, so um, everyone has seen a team board, right? So the, the idea of a scrum board for a team is, is nothing new. Target process has them. Um, here is just by story and task, so just getting down again to that team level. And dashboards. So dashboards, metrics. Um, dashboards are custom, uh, very similar paradigm uh, to, to a lot of tools out there. You can choose what you want on there. Um, this is a live team dashboard, and I wanted to scroll down towards the bottom. Here, we're, we're tracking a couple of things like our support close rate. We're actually supporting, looking at our support distribution across teams and who has what, looking for leakage and making sure we're healthy. Um, started getting into tracking the velocity per team. Um, there's a lot of different options for what you create. Um, just here there at the bottom is, uh, I have this one set up at the two team level here. Um, I also have this at, for various places within the organization. Um, that's just our capacity history. Right, so based on the total capacity, how our team is actually contributing to that overall capacity number per planning site. Um, metrics as a whole um, are, and did I load the, did not load the one up that I thought I would, uh, but metrics as a whole are actually a really cool feature within target process in that, So that's time. So five more minutes, thumbs up. We want to move on to Jira. Thumbs up. <laughs> All right. Here we go. <laughs>
Can you integrate uh, Terra Plus with Jenkins, like Selenium, Salesforce, and everything else? And Jira, can you combine Terra Process and Jira, for example? No. Uh, you can't combine target process and Jira because we've been able to do it completely through. Um, it does have plugins for things like Jenkins and a lot of testing frameworks, and there's the ability actually to write custom mashups and connections. And um, like we're getting ready to tackle Slack integration for okay. the first part of this year. And so it, it, it has a bunch in there, and they're adding to it all the time. Okay, sounds good. All right. So I. Maybe biased, but this is my favorite tool. Because I actually taught myself how to Groovy, meaning coding Groovy, so it can work the way I want. <laughs> um, so we're going to dive right into it. Um, just like what you saw before, we're going to have the same structure. Um, the way that we do it differently with uh, Portfolio for Jira, and I'll show you that now, is <coughs> We actually use multiple projects. So you have a project that's at your portfolio tier, and then you also have a project that's at all your product tiers. And then your delivery teams are inside of each of the product uh, tiers for this. So, go to. All right, so this is your portfolio plan. It operates off of an algorithm. Now the one thing to remember about algorithms is that they really represent the person who built them. <laughs> um, so it's really, this is a very complex algorithm. It's not, um, I'm already getting me scared. It's complex, but it's actually super powerful um, because it helps inform us um, for our instance of capacity. So right here you can see we have a roadmap at our strategy tier. If I look at the uh, plan that's underneath of it, I can see that I'm actually working within my capacity here. Um, and, and I can see that because it's in the green. Um, and our, it's our releases that are showing at the bottom. Yes? What add-ons are you currently using to help you to uh, get these visibilities? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. Because you're cheating. <laughs> so I'm going to dive into that a little bit. So um, the, I'm going to tell you the big ones. Right. Jira Miscellaneous Custom Fields. As you can see, my trial has expired. But don't worry. Um, it'll still work. So this gives me a scalable way to understand time and queue. Um, throughout the system of delivery. So I use it for metrics. Save Epic to Feature Translator. That means that everything that says Epic actually says Feature now. Who would have thought that we would need that? So I, now you don't have that, that gap of story where it's parent Epic, so it translates it. Um, JSU is all of my workflows. Um, I use that to configure those. Um, portfolio for Jira, roadmaps. Adaptivist Script Runner is the best plugin you could probably add other than portfolio for Jira because this is where you can run your advanced JQL queries so this way you can actually query what's in portfolio for Jira and you can create your, your scripted fields so this way you can calculate things such as read as short as shell first. Do those plugins work for other tools like Brown? Um, that's a good question. I could Wait, look for the answer but I don't know directly. Some of them do have some, like, like with crowd, some of them do. Like, I think Adaptive Script Runner probably does, but don't call me that. But other ones, no. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the main ones. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. For, for just for clarity, are you in Jira Cloud or Jira on prem? Jira on prem. Mm -hmm. So I, we've had a bunch of clients who use Jira and all of our transformation clients use on prem. It's actually a little bit more powerful, um, but newer functionality is going to be in the cloud for obvious reasons. The other thing that's awesome about uh, Portfolio for Jira is I have the ability to create scenarios, which means that I can actually plan out my options before I commit it to my system of delivery. And that is super important. So as I'm in here and I move over to my planning scenario, you can see now I'm in the red for my capacity. I need to make some changes either to my teams, and this is the way that it's driven. So I've done a little bit of cheating in here just because I want some queries to work the way I want them to work. So you're going to see I have my product teams in here with a uh, capacity of zero uh, velocity, or should I say velocity of zero because I'm driving views in the system. You don't actually need those here. I do kind of a uh, But you also have um, uh, your delivery teams, and I've made it so this way they have a low 
lower capacity so I could show you that if I change some of these things, that's going to help me out. So let me go into, we'll do this one, and I'll change it to 30. Oh, so as I go in here, um, what this is going to do is this is telling me what I've forecasted. If there's information in the system, I can click on pass velocity, and it will actually give me, based on the last uh, three to four sprints, um, calculate what it thinks would be the best velocity moving forward for your team. Um, so you have the ability to do what's calculated in the system, and it takes it directly from your board. Um, or you can set it yourself. And then once I make that change, I can calculate. Now that I've made that change, I've fixed some things, but obviously I'm still having some issues over here. So I have to throw up, dive into that to figure out um, what's going on. Now, don't just go willy-nilly and change your velocities because you think your team's going to be able to put out more, right? So talk to your teams. This is where you want to make sure that you're actually planning for something that's true. How many of you have worked in systems where they have put out a whole plan that you're system of delivery is not capable of actually doing because they just don't have enough capacity. Yeah? And how many times have you had a conversation It's just, it, it's like you're it, it's hard to get that message to them to say we have to change something. It's so much easier when you have data in front of you to say, look, we need to get this screen. We have these things happening here. What changes do we need to make? Because we can say, hey, we're going to move things out of this release. Or maybe we can put some more team on it. Or maybe we can actually get the same value if we reduce the scope. So going back over here, you know, I'm going to go into configuring this. I have my favorite configuration. Um, now there is a new experience. I have worked with it. It's not ready yet at scale. For if you're just working with um, one team using planning um, for a portfolio, go ahead and work with a new experience. It'll be nice. But at scale, they still have some room for improvement. The cool thing about it is they're releasing like every three weeks. So there's more stuff. What I'm showing you today is going to be different in three weeks. Um, so my favorite configuration for scheduling is definitely having our warnings. I like to base it on target dates because um, what happens with the algorithm is it's going to put something on your plan if it's sized or it's in something that has a start and end date, whether it is target start and end date on your actual item or it's in a release that has a start and end date or a sprint that has a start and end date. Now, sprints always have start and end dates, but releases don't always have start and end dates. So it might be a release, but it's a flexible start and end date. You won't see it on your uh, schedule. So we use the target start and end dates if we don't know the sizes of things, but we want to get it on the plan to really start thinking forward until we get the sizes. As soon as you start to estimate, um, it will change the algorithm, even if you have target dates. I also rank required work above dependent work um, to make sure that um, we are getting things done appropriately. I always turn off my dependent story constraint and concurrent work, and we don't use staging, so I always turn that off too. And we can go to details later about um, more of this, but it's important to understand which what things drive the algorithm and what settings we have. All right, so the other thing that's really cool about this is it actually gives us the ability to break down our backlog, which in Jira proper, as I call it, not Jira the whole, but portfolio, we can actually do these things. And what you'll notice, I can break things down, and they're in different projects, right? So you can see that I have my RS11, under, under that's my RI1, which is a different project underneath that is Max, right? So you still have the ability to have that uh, boil up, and you can still see across your system delivery, and not all be in the same project. service uh, the GPS service out before we can adjust locations 
Now, one important thing to know is I have 15 uncommitted changes. None of the, think about this as like a branch of code. We're taking a branch into our scenario and making changes, right? So for instance, if we're at a higher tier and we're trying to decide if we want to go with our internal team um, to build something out or outsource it, for instance. Um, and I know that's not an agile way to go, but sometimes those are real business decisions. And we want to map out what something might look like. Or we might want to hire more people. Or we might want to say, you have this uh, feature that you're trying to get out. What would it look like if we scaled it down and you have all these different scenarios? And we will pick the scenario we want to move with when we know all our options. And then affect your system forward. It is super nice to actually have those visions. So you, right now, I always, whenever I start with a client, I have a live scenario, which I tell them not to make any changes in, because we always want to know what, is, what does it look like today in the system of delivery. And now, when we make changes, how have our changes affected the plan? As you can see, I've messed up what my system's capable of doing in this plan. So, any questions about that? Sometimes it's a hard concept to see at first. The other thing that I really um, enjoy about this, I'm actually going to drop down. So in this project, we have initiatives and epics. The epics board is actually pulling from multiple projects. So you can see all the epics for Drive, Ride, and this Redshare portfolio. And there's other um, projects too, but just for the sake of the demo, um, this is what we have. Um, and then you can still do your reports and everything like that. Now if I go into I can just filter based on my right ethics. And this also keeps it a little cleaner too. So this way if everything is in the same project, you have to decide which boards to work out of. And that becomes a nightmare sometimes to uh, see all that information. So um, let me go to the back of I'm gonna create finish or something this way. So the other thing that uh, we incorporate with Jira is teaching people how to do their work in the system. Um, so as you can see, we have different areas here. Um, so for instance, in problem statement, can you guys see that okay? So um, if we want, if, if people are still learning how to use the system or you get a lot of turnover, it's nice that the system is teaching you what to do. So um, for problem statement, for instance, we broke it out into pieces. Oh, one thing to note, you're going to see in here that this says feature, this is a bug in the Epic the Feature Translator, they're actually fixing it, it should be fixed by some prior soon. Back to the regular schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's teaching us um, how to actually do this thing in the system. So not only do we just have um, our uh, fields here, we're knowing what to do it uh, with it. So, and this is all customizable, so this is just in a scheme, and it doesn't necessarily affect everything else that's in JIRA, as long as you operate in the scheme. Um, so we've got our desired outcome, our success criteria, uh, linking our personas, um, talking about how that should be used, etc. So it's really nice um, to have those changes. Are any of you guys doing anything like that now in your system to kind of help drive the understanding? Oh, two more minutes. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. I'll go back to the portfolio. So when we look at when we look at the releases in here um, in our planning scenario, um, this is what's showing us what is um, the issue. So for instance, this March one, and the way that you can create uh, releases in Portfolio for Jira is you can do them across projects. So I wanted to make the same release across specific projects. So this way we can all operate in the same system. So I can see that it's this guy that's causing these problems. I can drive down even lower and, and look at where it is. So it's telling me it's going to take me to 4.2, and this is 3.31. I might have to stay with that. I might be okay with that, right? But I get to make the decision. I have it in front of me. I have to. This way, we can be predictable and really understand our expectations. Yes. So we we um, in small group of us try portfolio for Jira and. It was a nightmare to, to try to figure this out. We watched the videos and read the papers, mm -hmm. and it just wouldn't work right. And um, I think this was maybe six months ago, so it was maybe just a little bit buggy. But you seem to have a great handle on this. And my question is, how long did it take you to become efficient? Oh, yeah. Probably, so I, honestly, I 
I give you a head start, right? But it took me about a year to get here. It took me a long time to learn the algorithms. It took me a long time to learn the UI. Thumbs up uh, for more Jira, or do you want to move on to version one? More Jira? More version one. Okay, that was really hard. Jira? I need hands. <laughs> version one. Oh, that's equal. All right, now I need you guys to stand up. Jira? <laughs> <laughs>
not going to be worth looking at. What I've done instead is that what can actually pull something like this. One minute. Oh, one minute. Okay, I won't pull it up. So what we've done is we've created. Um, if we go into the queries. What I'm trying to do now is do what we've done in the STS, where you can have queries pop into the dashboard, but it's not as easy. It, it's really tricky. I'm, and I'm working with a few different plugins to do it, but the plugins have bugs, and it's been a challenge. But um, so, for instance, um, go here. Uh, we'll do this one. Um, so if I want to know anything that's new that's committed in a certain sprint, or so the one. I've added these queries in here, um, and what we've done is we've been able to take them and put them in a spreadsheet, and then create a dashboard in the spreadsheet. Talk to me in another month, because I'm solving this problem in the right now. The query language is much richer here than there is in uh, visual levels. Yeah, yes, and the query, I, I can get a whole lot better queries in here for sure. As you can see, it even calculates them. Yeah, so you so saw that for the six points. All right, five more minutes, or where's your wife? Room, room closes at eight. What time is room closes? Oh, yeah. You're, not, you're at eight minutes otherwise. Okay. So just point that out. Question, do we want to see version one, or do we want to retro and do the uh, wrap-up? Yeah, version so one? and teams working um, in these work items as well. So that's pretty nice for there. Now when I go into my team room, so team rooms are different from planning rooms where everything that's planning is a portfolio item. And then in team rooms, you have um, everything that's your delivery team pretty much. So all of your stories, things like that. Portfolio items is everything above a story above. Um, we'll go into to do everything that we need to do, we can task it out right in here. I actually had something ready for this. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to see all our information we have uh, go to here. So you can drive what your uh, burn down looks like as well if you want to change some of your variables. The other cool thing about um, version one is just 
like uh, part of the process is you have the ability to see a lot of information from within your um, actual work paper. So you have for history, you can visualize. There's a really robust analytics piece to Portfolio for Jira, but um, how many of you guys have used that? I'm oh, no, sorry, not Portfolio for Jira. I'm getting you mic up. For version one, how many of you guys have used version one's analytics? How many of you have noticed that this time of day it's really slow? <laughs> so what they do is it's like a 24 hour um, refresh of the data. So for whatever reason, at least in every instance I've used, at this time of day it doesn't really work out. But um, the cool thing about it is that all those um, queries and things like that, they might want to do an addition, you can do that right in that kind of like this piece. Um, you can try to go into it, but it's a little more be a little slow. Um, let's see, the other thing that um, some people um, have complained about a little bit, I'll go back into this one, is that your portfolio items have to follow the same process. Well, there's ways to get around that. As you can see with my initiative Kanban, it's actually different than my epic Kanban. I have different steps. And we've used the um, creating um, a, what's it called? a different um, area. I think it's called a workspace. Um, so you can configure different workspaces. The problem, I would say, with that is it's kind of, um, it's a lot of configuration to do, which is still, uh, it's, it, it still gives you what you need as far as every single work item, but you need to make sure that your work items are at each different area of your project so that you can configure it in that way. It also gives the autonomy. Um, and that's just for the portfolio items. All right. Okay, guys. I hope that this was good. I know we went through a lot of tools and a little bit of time. Um, so before we go to the restaurant, let's go ahead and do the wrap. Yep. While we're waiting for the wrap-up, I have a quick question. So, yep. of the tools, which one were browser-based and which one would require a client? I think Target Plus process with a client, right? Target yeah. Plus browser. 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 So they're all browser. Yeah. Yep. Browser and mobile. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Oh, oh yeah, Archer, he's the best. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll do the wrap real quickly. Uh, before I do that, just uh, obviously there can only be one winner. Uh, if you didn't win, there's a card on your table for the upcoming class that we're hosting, uh, Leading Safe. Uh, there's a $200 discount on there as well. Um, and then we also have a class coming up in, uh, in June. And um, uh, for our classes, if we have uh, somebody that uh, provides a host site, um, that company will get uh, five free seats for the class as well. So. Um, just keep that in mind as we have classes coming up. So I'll go ahead and uh, pick the winner. We'll give a consolation prize as well. <laughs>